I'm going to ask that you take uh, your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. And uh, stand, the, the pulpit mic is down a little, but the uh, lapel is up just a smidgen uh, too much. Things sometimes that uh, those um, cantatas and that get a little twisted around is what's, what happened. Yeah, that's what happens. We, yeah. Okay. Second Samuel, chapter five. Now we have uh, gone over the uh, study of the giants quite a bit here at our church uh, several times. Uh, but there are those who um, come in and are interested in uh, this sort of thing and uh, want to know about it. And we try to accommodate um, uh, anyone who is interested in any Bible doctrine best we can. Uh, but I thought that uh, we would approach this uh, in a little bit of a different way than we have before and uh, uh, study uh, what we're going to call the two Rephaim eruptions. Now, this is uh, something that is not readily known uh, amongst uh, uh, believers, but uh, there were, or uh, there are in the Bible, two Rephaim eruptions. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, the word Rephaim in the Hebrew means stitched together ones. And it has to do with genetics and putting a, a genetic package together and getting a finished product. And uh, there were two of these. One, as we'll see, that came from the angels, and the other from human beings. Now, the word eruption is used theologically to reflect these uh, two occurrences, these two events. And uh, an eruption is um, uh, an invasion, an interruption in the normal course of things, uh, uh, that, uh, that sort of thing. So you have to remember that when we're talking about these two Rephaim eruptions, there were two occurrences when Satan tried to interrupt the normal course of things by uh, utilizing genetic manipulation. Uh, one to destroy uh, the line of Christ and the other to destroy God's chosen people. So there were two times he interrupted or intervened in the course of human history and uh, that is why theologically they are called eruptions. Now, what we're going to do is take these two Rephaim occurrences, and we'll call them sources because that's actually what they are. They uh, are roots or origins from which a group of people or beings came into existence. But to get a, a good understanding of this, the best thing to do is to contrast them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a foundation, and uh, we're going to put on this the Rephaim eruptions. Now, the word Rephaim is used several times in the Scripture, and sometimes it's, um, uh, it's difficult to understand because it is translated dead. Now, dead comes from the Hebrew word muth as well. So sometimes dead comes from muth, and sometimes dead comes from Rephaim. So you have to go back to the original languages to sort this all out. But there are times when the translators just simply brought it over and transliterated it from the original language and called it Rephaim. Verse number 18. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of the Rephaim. Now this is a geographical location where the Rephaim or the stitched together ones lived. But as we're going to see here in just a little bit, there are two kinds of Rephaim. And it's important for us to make this distinction. The first kind of Rephaim comes from angelic fathers. So if you'll uh, take your Bible and go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 6,
and we'll be going to several places and sometimes back to the same place uh, to get uh, documentation, verification on what we're talking about here. Verse number six in Genesis, or excuse me, verse one in Genesis six, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born to them. Now note, they obviously had sons as well, but that's not the important issue here. The important issue is that there were uh, females of the human race that were born. And the sons of God, not the sons of men, saw that the daughters of men were fair. Now, immediately we have to remember our history. God put man out of the garden and he stationed angels at the gates of the garden, particularly the eastern gate, to keep man from coming back into the garden to eat of the tree of life. So these angels were there, and we're going to have a second angelic fall, but it's not in following Lucifer, it's because these angels left their first estate, says, um, says Jude, uh, and they became man, and they took them wives of all that they chose. So verse number four, there were giants in the earth in those days. After that, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare them children. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now this is, uh, uh, the sons of God here is the Hebrew, Beneha Elohim, which is always attributed to angels, the sons of God. Uh, they are sons in a secondary sense to the Son, Jesus Christ, but sons nonetheless. Uh, and so it was this group of angels stationed, whatever type of uh, uh, amount of angels were stationed on the earth at that time. These kept seeing these fair daughters of men come to church at the eastern gate where uh, uh, Abel sacrificed, where Cain came. And finally they decided we're going to become incarnate so that we can have relations with these women. And so that's exactly what they did. They were angelic fathers. All right. Now, on the other hand, if you'll turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. Numbers, chapter 13. The second Raphaim eruption came by way of the human race. Starting with verse number 31, Israel was going into the land, they were Kadesh Barnea, uh, the 12 spies, uh, and uh, 10 of them came back with this report. The men that went up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people of the land, Israel, Canaan land, they're stronger than we. They brought an evil report of the land which they uh, had searched unto the children of Israel. The land which we have gone to search it is the land that eats the inhabitants thereof. All the people we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, uh, which come of the giants. And uh, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So, uh, when it says these were uh, descendants of the giants, it's talking about the fact that this group of large uh, human beings, and we'll see how big they are in just a little bit, had human fathers. It was not an angelic eruption, it was a human eruption uh, um, with regard to um, the fact that they were still manipulating uh, the uh, genes of a certain family. We'll consider that in a moment. Okay, right now the first thing we want to see is the first guy, angel, who, who started it all. If you'll come with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 9. And verse number 11, Abaddon was one of the uh, Morning Star Quartet. 
He, uh, it's Michael, Gabriel, um, Lucifer, and Abaddon. They were all archangels. Lucifer fell, leaving three. Abaddon fell subsequent to Lucifer's original fall when he took flesh. Now, Abaddon is the, the destroyer, and he undoubtedly was stationed uh, at the eastern gate of the garden, seeing these women and took human flesh, because we find him being put away rather than being able to, like the other fallen angels that uh, went with Lucifer, uh, uh, just uh, flit around uh, the universe. But verse number 11 says, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. We're sticking here with the, the Hebrew. So Abaddon is the king. He is in charge. He is the archangel. He is the one who was in charge of the battalion on earth to keep the tree of life. Now, what does Jude say about him? Turn to the book of Jude. Book of Jude and verse number six, chapter one. These are the angels which kept not their first estate. Their first estate was they had a spiritual body, but they left their own habitation. They took a body of flesh, their own habitation. They left the spirit realm or dominion and he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Now, they are evidently freed for a short time during the tribulation period and allowed to come out, and Abaddon is set free. Uh, if you will, come to 2 Peter chapter 2. For God spared not the angels that sinned. Now, this is not talking about Lucifer's first group but cast them down to Tartarus. Deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. See, this is a, a different set of angels that committed a distinct sin of leaving their first estate, their own habitation, and cohabiting with human women. And so Abaddon is the first of, of these fathers, uh, if you will. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse number 19, these are the ones that are led out following their king, Abaddon, in the tribulation period. Verse 19, 1 Peter 3. By which also we went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So here we have a Rephaim eruption. But uh, on one or two, two of them to consider. On the one side, it's angelic fathers. These are the ones that took human flesh so that they could uh, marry and have relations with, uh, as it says, uh, their wives there in Genesis 6. The one who led in this sin uh, was Abaddon. Okay, let's go back to the book of Numbers, chapter 13 again. And verse number 33. And there we saw the giants the sons of, actually the Hebrew pronunciation is Anak. Uh, so they are sons of Anak. Now the name Anak means neck, or that from which the, the body grows out, as, as it were. He's the, he's the head honcho, he's the dad. He's where it begins, uh, as it were. Uh, and uh, if you'll note, it says, which come of the giants. Evidently, there was some um, genetic manipulation. I'm going to bring the, the next two, um, two uh, uh, points up on the board while we're here. The sons of Anak evidently inbred. 
Now, if you want a modern day um, example of this, just go to what Hitler tried to do. Uh, accomplishing a purebred Aryan race, uh, and all others were going to be killed, eliminated, eradicated, uh, so that they could begin their breeding of, uh, of tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, uh, Germans, uh, and so forth. Uh, but that means that you get rid of all of the corrupt seed that might cause, uh, cause them to look something different and be something different than, than what they are. And that means there has to be inbreeding to get to that point. And so, uh, if, if anybody was less than six feet tall here in the family of Anak, they were, they were, they were pitched out, that's that too bad. Uh, these guys were giants and, and they were huge and they were big, but it took inbreeding and that's why the scripture says, they're sons of Anak, it started there, which come of the giants. They, they, were, they took the tallest, the biggest and so forth and inbred them to get this race of very large human beings. But now on the other hand, come back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6 and it says there were giants when the sons of God came in this verse number 4 to the daughters of men and they bear children to them. And they begat a hybrid. Now, inbreeding and, and having a hybrid are two different things. A hybrid means you take from two different types of stocks and, and genetics and so forth and, and blend them into one. We see the uh, especially uh, at, uh, at springtime, we see the uh, seed commercials where they talk about hybrids and, uh, and picking and choosing the best and making it a stronger, better tasting, sweeter, whatever uh, type of, of plant uh, and vegetable and, and so forth. Uh, and this is where it came from. Now, one of the problems with regard to this is that it's spilled over uh, into the animal uh, creation. But while we're here, let's look at... Um, another word. It says in verse number four, there were giants in the earth in those days. Now this is the progeny of the angels and the women. Now here's where we get the word Nephilim. The, Neph the Rephaim actually is an umbrella term because all of these are stitched together genetically. It's, it wasn't a natural union. It wasn't after its kind. Or if it was after its kind, it was an inbred type of deal uh, to get to the best and the biggest and the brightest of, of its kind. But you'll note, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. The, the outcome of this type of, of breeding formed Nephilim. So, uh, Nephilim actually are Rephaim. The stitched together ones become the fallen ones. That's what Nephal means in the Hebrew. They're not the standard that God created by way of creation uh, at, at the point when he made Adam. That's the type of human being he wants. And yet, uh, Nephal means fallen from the standard, uh, coming short of what God uh, originally intended. So here's where the word Nephilim is used. But guess what? Come back to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13. And verse number 33. This is the second place where the Nephilim are used. Or where the word is used, rather. And there we saw the giants, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. Now see, you've got two groups here. One formed giants because of the hybrid. The other formed giants because of inbreeding. Uh, one was a combination of angel and, and man. One uh, was a combination of the biggest of the men uh, in the family, the biggest of the, the men and women in the family. 
Uh, and it, it kept it in the family, didn't marry outside of the family, and they were very careful. They came of the giants. That means that they watched who made it so that they might get this large uh, race uh, of people. All right. Now, let's go back to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 6. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry. Perhaps you should just keep your, uh, keep your hand there for a while anyway. Or just fold the page of your Bible over. Now, why did God flood the entire earth? He flooded the entire earth because these Nephilim didn't keep to themselves. Now here we have angels and human women forming Nephilim, which would be male and female. They made it with other humans uh, uh, and, and so forth. And they evidently mated with the animals. This is the reason for the flood. Verse number uh, 11. Or when it says in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. He was a just man and perfect. Tamayim, he was genetically perfect in his generations. He wasn't tainted with the Nephilim. The earth was corrupt genetically before God, filled with violence. God looked upon the earth and said, all flesh has corrupted his way upon the earth. The end of all flesh is come before me. I will destroy them with the earth. Actually, he's going to destroy them with the flood. And that's exactly what he did. Except for those humans that were in the ark, which were perfect, genetically perfect, and those other animals which he sanctioned, brought, bringing them into the ark, all other life forms drowned in the flood. Chapter 7, verse number 21. All flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl, cattle, beast, every creeping thing, and every man all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. Every living substance was destroyed upon the face of the earth. Man, cattle, creeping things, bow. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And so, this is the reason, because they included the animals in, in their um, uh, sexual escapades. All right. On the other hand, and uh, this is just from uh, um, the observation of, of, of there is no Bible verse that says that they did. This other group of giants did not include the animals. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, if they did have what is called bestiality, it wouldn't have mattered. Because evidently, the only way you could, you could have conception with the animals is if there were the angelic genetics involved. Uh, evidently, they're the only ones powerful enough to bring, bring life. Angelic, human, animal combinations uh, together. These just simply um, um, mated the old-fashioned way uh, with, the, with the male and female of humans, but they inbred them by watching uh, who was born and uh, who made it and so forth. So God's going to destroy both groups, but uh, on the one hand, uh, there are different reasons for why he does. All right. As we just saw, this particular group was killed by the flood. But the other group is killed by Israel. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2. And verse number 9. Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession. Uh, I have given R unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Imims dwelt there. The Imims were part of the clan of the human Rephaim. A great people, many and tall, as the Anakims, 
which were also accounted giants. It's the Anakims, the Moabites uh, call them Emims. The Horims dwell in, in Sur and so forth. Uh, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did to the land of his possession when the Lord gave it to him. You see, uh, we've got um, uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb. J and Caleb said, I want that mountain that the Lord has given me. But on that mountain, guess what? Rephaim were there. And he had to go up there. And mind you, he was uh, 80 years of age. And he says, I'm as strong as the day when God promised it 40 years back. I'm as strong today as I was back then. He went up there and he killed the whole bunch of these giants. And they were big. We'll show you in a moment. Stay tuned for uh, coming to Don't you just hate that in the news? Now, now they give you a little bit of the weather and say, we're going to give you a little more. And about, you know, three or four minutes later, they give you another. And then they say, stay tuned. And then you and it makes you watch the whole show. Just waiting for the full report here. OK, well, that's just a pet peeve. It's nothing doctrinal or spiritual involved in that. Just uh, kind of gets on your nerves. Verse 19. When you come nigh to the children of Ammon, distress them not, meddle not to with them. I've given it to Lot. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in an old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims, people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. God said, go in and take the land and kill them all. And that's what they did. They killed a young and old and so forth. And especially they did with regard to the these particular Rephaim, these uh, giants. Um, now, let's go from this point to chapter 3. And uh, let's look at Og, verse number 1. Then we turned and went up to the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle. Now, how big was Og? The name sounds a little ominous. We're going to meet King Og. Og, you can hear it, Og, Og, Og. Big guy. How do we know? Verse number 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It was nine cubits in length, four cubits in breadth. All right, now again, you have the common cubit and the royal cubit, and unless it's specified, the common cubit, which is 18 inches uh, from the uh, tip of a, a man's uh, largest uh, finger uh, down to his uh, elbow there, the common cubit, that's 18 inches. Times nine means that this bed was 13 and a half feet long. It was, um, uh, as it says here in verse number 11, uh, four cubits in breadth. Again, means it was six feet wide. Now here was a big man. Uh, the NBA would, uh, would <laughs> give bonuses, cars, and sign him for more than just a season's term. Uh, he, was, he was a very, very large man, and he was said to be of the giants. Well, as a matter of fact, let's turn to uh, uh, 1 Samuel, You've got to watch my time. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And verse number four. Now here is uh, here is the theory, and I believe that it's uh, quite possible that it's true that there were some of these giants that escaped, saw that they were being killed, and escaped. And of course, now we have Goliath, born subsequent to all the time when Israel came into the land and fought with the giants, that they actually had some to escape and come back in the form of Goliath and his four brothers. Also, that some went, and the, um, uh, the Neanderthal-type uh, skulls that are being found were actually these giants. The, the, the missing link, it's not a missing link at all, it's a Nephilim. Now, if you understand, 
the right side of your screen. Those Nephilim are going to have a resurrection. Those Nephilim, uh, though their name was snuffed out, their remembrance is not snuffed out. But on the left side, you're, we're going to read verses where God says, I'm, 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 going to, um, I'm going to just, except for his word, I'm going to erase any type of, um, of memory or remembrance of you on the earth. So here's Goliath of Gath, verse number uh, four. His height was six cubits, that's nine feet, and a span. Now a span is from the thumb to the little finger. As you spread your hand, it's about six inches. So he was six inches short of being 10 feet tall. A very, very large uh, man. Second Samuel chapter 21. And Goliath actually had uh, some, some brothers here. Verse 19, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines. And uh, another brother of Goliath was killed. And it says in the last part of verse 19, there was another battle in Gath. There was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Now, here's a guy that's going to need some special sandals for sure. Uh, and he was born to the giant, it says. Uh, and verse number 22, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, uh, again, when David went to face Goliath, he bent down and he chose, the, the number is specific, five smooth stones. Why did he choose five? One for Goliath and four more for his brothers. He was going to take care of the whole family of giants because he knew there'd be a vendetta, that they would try to get vengeance on him and so forth. And that's why David uh, uh, did, did it. But Goliath was not of angelic ancestry. But he still was a Rephaim. He still was of this other category of, um, of giants. Uh, and he was called a Nephilim, but he was different than the first group. Okay? Now, here's the thing about this group that we're talking about as we turn to the book of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. And verse number one, there came over into the other, uh, side, they came over to the other side of the sea, and there was come out uh, a man of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, Mark 5, 3, who had his dwellings in the tomb. No man could bind him, no, not with chains, he's very strong, because that he had been often bound with chains, but he plucked them asunder, and no man could tame him. He was always night and day in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. Now, <laughs> I, I, please forgive me. This, this is not a private joke. You'll get it. Uh, the, the souls of the ones that come from this first group of, of Nephilim are roaming the earth. They are the demons. And we'll show you why here in just a little bit. And it, it, they're demons who lived thousands of years before, and they were the Nephilim who, who uh, some, uh, the, uh, the devil here was the Nephilim, but also there were others involved here, the, the Rephaim were involved well, with the animals. Actually, they're all Rephaim, but we try to make a distinction, uh, and I'll show you why here in a moment. Uh, why was he night and day in the mountains? That's it's specific. Well, remember, these beings got killed by what event? The flood. <laughs> Why is he in the mountains? Because up there they lost their bodies somewhere. They took the high ground. 
Uh, but it says that if for 15 cubits above the highest mountain on the earth, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the waters um, uh, over, um, covered over the, these mountains. But they were in the mountains and in the tombs. Why are they in the tombs? What is in the tomb? Dead bodies or bodies, uh, and uh, so that they can possess them. They've lost their bodies, and that's what they're looking for. Demon possession means they want a body to possess. Uh, and so it came and ran to, to Jesus, and uh, he said, come out of him, verse 8. He said, what is your name? My name, singular, is Legion, for we, plural, are many. And he besought that he would not send him out of the country, but that there was nigh to the mountains a, a great herd of swine feeding. All the devils besought him, send us to the swine, we may enter into them. Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, about 2,000 of them, they choked in the sea. Guess what? Deja vu. <laughs> We've been here and done that. Uh, this is how we lost our first body. And sure enough, they tried not to get it happen again. And they no sooner entered into the pigs and down into the drink they went. And they all uh, pigs drowned. Uh, so note verse 15. They come to see Jesus. And he that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. Now, the, the term devil indicates that there was a bigger, more powerful presence in this man. And I believe that that, that is the um, soul of one who was a pure Nephilim, angel and man. Bigger, stronger, more powerful, more violent and fierce as you saw the, this man here. The others were the souls of Rephaim. Probably the combinations, the mongrelized combinations uh, caused a dwarfing in, in the, the spirit essence, the size of it and so forth. And so you have this overpowering force, this dominant force, the devil, and he also had a legion. My name is Legion for we are many. I'm representing the whole group here, but I'm in charge, you say. Their souls are on earth. Are their spirits of the dead roaming the earth? The answer to that is yes, absolutely. Are they human beings? Well, yes, in part they are, but they're angels and men, and or angels, men, and animals. On the other hand, when the second category of giants died, their souls are in hell. Why? Because they're pure human beings, just genetically manipulated, genetically manufactured, uh, and uh, and so forth. Okay, let's, let's bring this up. S the reason that the that these uh, beings are looking for a body is that they have no resurrection. On the other hand, this group will have a resurrection. However, and we'll uh, it's this first group that actually um, produced the demons. The second Rephaim eruption producing the giants did not produce demons. They were purebred humans. The demons, on the other hand, came from the first group uh, of, of Nephilim, which was the first Rephaim eruption. So keep these terms straight, and you will be able to sort it all out and, uh, and, and uh, and keep it uh, correct. Job chapter 26. Follow with me, we're going to hurry here. Job chapter 26. I think I did those, I think I started a few minutes later. I've, I've got plenty of time, I think. Verse 4, to whom hast thou uttered words, and whose spirit came from thee? However, Rephaim, dead things. Rephaim is the, is the um, uh, Hebrew word, the Rephaim. Job 26, uh, 5 now. Are formed under the waters. That's how they came to be. Now, not their physical body 
but it's talking about the the ghosts, the spirit, the demons that that uh, that came uh, uh, from this. The Rephaim were formed under the waters. They just they were tall. So what did God to do? He just simply made the waters a little taller than than the tallest mountain, so that none of them could ever survive. It was an impossibility for them to tread that much water for that long. There was no food, no no drinking water, and uh, everything that had had breath died. But it says they were formed. Literally, they squirmed loose is, is the literal translation. They twisted forth. They, they dropped their body and they came out. Uh, they're confined to the earth. That, that, that's true. But they still can move about quickly and go where they want to on this planet. All right. Proverbs chapter 2. Now, if our tape goes off, I, I'm going to... Uh, still finish it um, so that we're, we're not hurried with this and you get all the um, all the information. I'm sorry we couldn't get it all on the tape. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 16. The Rephaim are interested in mingled seed. Now if you are interested in mingled seed, where would you go to view human beings intermingling seed. House of prostitution. To deliver thee from the strange woman, a prostitute. The stranger which flatters with her words. Forsaking the guide of her youth, forgetting the covenant of her God, her house, that's prostitution, inclines to death and her paths unto the Rephaim. Found again right there. Why? Because the Rephaim are watching. Because here you have one woman who has many men placing seed in her. And that, that's, it, it's mingled seed that they're interested in. And so uh, evidently the, what the book of uh, Proverbs is telling us, that, um, that they are there watching this, uh, this uh, action go on, uh, because that's how they came about, with mingled seed, angels, humans, animals. All right, let's move to, um, to Psalms 88. Psalms and Isaiah, and then we'll change the, the slide. Psalms 88, verse number 10. Here we have the two Hebrew words used together. The fact is, both are referring to these creatures, but it says, will you show wonders to the dead, Muth. Uh, the dead ones are, are dead forever in, in this sense because they're never going to have physical life again. Shall the dead, the Rephaim, arise and praise you? Think about it. It's not going to happen, says David. The Rephaim don't have a resurrection. Now, how do we know that? Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Two verses here. Verse number 14. They are moose. They're dead, physically dead. They shall not live, reference to their body, the body of the Rephaim that were lost in the flood. They are deceased, yes, but it's the Hebrew Rephaim. They are Rephaim. They shall not rise. There's no resurrection of this group of beings. You have visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. They're not going to have a body. They're not going to come forth at, at the final uh, call. Um, there, uh, there's going to be a connection that I'll, I'll uh, give to you here in just a little bit uh, with regard to physical bodies uh, and that final call, but not in the body they were born with, not in the body that they were conceived with. Verse number 19. Thy dead men shall live, and my dead body uh, and with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, 
and the earth, last part of the verse, shall cast out the Rephaim. There's not going to be any natural, physical body that they will have, the one that they were born with, it's, it's done, it's too late for them.